This the... conference will now be recorded. Awesome. Perfect. Now we're ready to go. All right. So thank you, everybody, um, for joining us today. This is the RTD Accountability Committee, the Governance Subcommittee. Um, and I, I do hope that folks did get a chance to at least do a quick walk around the block today. The weather is fantastic. If not, then definitely do it right after this meeting because I just came in from a walk and it was, it was a perfect day out there. So make sure to get some fresh air. Um, so on our agenda, first off is um, our December 21st meeting summary. Those notes have been put in our agenda. So um, if folks have any questions or concerns about those, please um, bring that back to staff so we could correct that if needed. Um, and then first up, it looks like we're going to be having a presentation, um, a briefing on RTD service development and core network. And so who is presenting? Is that going to be Jesse presenting today? Or I also see that we have Deborah Johnson on, on the line as well. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Jesse will orient you all to okay. our core transit network. I'm here to answer any questions and recognizing you know, with this new round of stimulus money, I am anticipating questions as it relates to going forward and happy to address those uh, from an organizational standpoint if need be. So thank you very kindly. Great, fantastic. All right, Jesse, if you are on and ready, you could kick off the presentation whenever you have your slides up. I don't know who's doing slides, but there we go. Slides have appeared. Great, thank you so much, guys. This is Jesse Carter. I'm not sure if everyone can hear me, so I just want to make sure that I'm coming in clear. I'm doing this over my phone because my internet connection is not the greatest. I live at the cul-de-sac of uh, the Xfinity system, so I apologize if I'm not coming in clear. We hear you just fine. Thank you for joining us. Fantastic, fantastic. I will also be joined by the manager of operations planning in our system uh, planning department, Doug Monroe. So he has a, a role in this presentation as well. Okay, so with that said, I, I do want to thank uh, you for inviting me to actually speak about this this subject. I, I really am happy to present anything that uh, pertains to service planning or operations planning when it comes down to RTD's transit network. So first, uh, I want to state that while it's not defined in RTD's current service development policies and standards, um, you know, defining a core system is a part of the Reimagine RTD effort. Um, the R the Reimagine RTD effort has been officially put on pause. However, future efforts will include defining an RTD core system. In lieu of that Reimagine effort, uh, this presentation is intended to describe the district's service development policies and the role or impact of current system design. So if I can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is information you've probably seen in a lot of different places, and that is a description of the district itself. Um, but I want to say that the, the RTD is an amalgamation of former localized transit providers unified under a regional mission to provide mobility for the metro area. As with all public concerns, the capabilities of the district are subject to resource availability and existing infrastructure. So, um, we have an area that is about 2,400 square miles. We were serving 3 million people. The land use in the area is very diverse, ranging from light industrial to urban core. Uh, we have 127 fixed routes and 12 rail lines and over 10,000 bus stops, 76 rail stations. Uh, so it's a lot, it's a big effort to actually uh, devise plans and maintain the service in the area. So the picture on the right of the screen is a snapshot of my very handsome and good looking team of uh, planners that we have that, that work in the area. You'll also notice that we are broken up into three geographic areas. We have a north team, we have a west team, and we have an east team. We also have a separate planning team for the uh, rail services, uh, we, those are two-person teams as far as rail and three-person teams as far as the bus network is concerned. We also have a, uh, a small team that deals with special services. It, oh, I think we lost you. Sorry, one of the reasons why I was okay. receiving this is the problem when you present over your phone. <laughs> I, I apologize. For that. 
<laughs> so what I was saying is I wanted to present the information that's to the right because the, the map that you know notes the geographic team areas also uh, kind of points out one of the general challenges that we have. And that is even though we are segmented in geographic locations, uh, many of our root services actually extend beyond those boundaries. Uh, we have uh, an East team and a West team, and there, be, there, there will be times in which the East team and the West team will be working on the same route. So they have to coordinate their efforts there. And that's something we do on a regular basis. So go to the next slide. So the RTD operates all of its service as a transit network, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Mobility needs often extend beyond the jurisdictional boundaries and the variety of services, be it rail, regional bus, local and suburban service, flex ride, van pool, and access ride cross out all boundaries and in combination provide customers the trips they need. So we operate, operate what we term uh, is a modified grid system. Uh, that's where you have east, uh, east, west, and north, south type of routes that cross each other. And I want to note that over 50% of our customers transfer at least once to get to their final destination. Uh, we, we have that as a feature because it allows us to be a, a lot more efficient with our services. One thing I would want to key in on looking at the map, you'll see that there are a multitude of dots. This map is representative of, again, pre-COVID uh, ridership. So this ridership is a picture of basically August 2019 ridership where we're are, we were at 300,000 boardings per day on a normal day. You'll see the smaller dots represent, you know, stop locations where uh, passengers are, can board the RTD uh, bus services. The larger dots are usually representative of either major stops or facilities that those services are going into. You'll see larger blue dots in the central area, the, the, in the downtown Denver. Uh, those are our civic center, DUS station and another blue dot to the to the south. That's Broadway I-25, which is a uh, a point where a lot of our light rail meets. But one characteristic that I want to point out is that when you look at the the level of ridership, it is spread throughout the district. Not necessarily evenly, but it is spread throughout the district, and there are significant levels of ridership in each quadrant. So if we can go to the next slide. Here I want to talk about, um, or actually I'm going to ask Doug Monroe if he can go into some detail in explaining, as an example, the Route 76, which is Wadsworth, which runs north-south. We've had to lean this map over because it's such a long route, but I want, uh, want, want to know if uh, Doug is on the line so he can kind of go through some of the characteristics of the Route 76. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Uh, so this is a map of Route 76 here with uh, north being to the left of the map here. Um, and as Jesse mentioned on the previous slide, RTD operates a modified grid system. And basically what that means is um, for, for these routes that operate on main arterials like Wadsworth Boulevard here for Route 76, um, those connections that over 50% of our passengers make uh, occur on the street um, where the two routes cross each other. Um, but another feature of the modified grid system as well is to have uh, transit centers, which Route 76 has um, at the Old Town Arvada Station uh, and up at US 36 and Broomfield Station, where routes that don't necessarily conform exactly to the grid can pull into those stations and uh, and passengers can make their connections there as well. Um, Route 76 serves as, as such a great example of how uh, of how that interconnected system works in our grid system. Uh, it, it travels through six different municipalities in three different counties, um, and you can and uh, connects to um, 25 connecting routes. That, that allows uh, passengers to connect to 25 different municipalities and six of the counties that RTD serves. So with one connection from Route 76 here, you can get to uh, to any county within the RTD district besides a direct connection to, to Weld County or uh, Douglas County. Okay. Next slide. Thanks, Doug. So to implement its mission, RTD has a uh, service development policy standards and processes to provide a comprehensive rationale to accommodate various travel markets, service types, and uh, federal regulations. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that guide us as far as federal regulations. So 
listed here are our family of services. So just a brief descriptor of each. Our rail corridors, we expect very high ridership from because they serve high density corridors. Uh, the Central District Business District local services, which serve downtown Denver, are also expected to have higher ridership. We also have urban locals that don't go to the CBD, but are, are expected to have higher ridership. Again, there's a thing. Uh, and then we have suburban local services serving low to medium density suburban areas where we have a different set of standards for them. Our regional services, that they serve both the CBD and other major ridership generators, uh, are, are line haul routes that are expected to have high performance in terms of their overall efficiency, but we recognize that the services typically operate uh, open door and then go onto the highway where operating closed door. So there are a special set of circumstances for that level of service. And then we have flex ride, which is our door to park and ride type of service, which you know provides um, transit service for areas where we have great difficulty uh, e either due to roadway uh, structure or other impediments. So with that, next slide. So we have a set of service standards and policies that are designed to be you know, fair and equitable. Uh, so we're always comparing our services apples to apples. So it isn't the expectation that we would look at an area that's a suburban environment and expect the same level of ridership as we would, let's say, along Colfax Avenue going into the downtown area. So we do have a set of service standards. Uh, our service standards are also supported by, you know, an overall goal, again, speaking back to some of the limitations that any public entity has, and that is trying to make sure that we're getting um, uh, return on investment for the taxpayer dollar. So our services need to be cost effective. Uh, we have to pay attention to both annual budget, revenue projections, and our operator contract. Um, it's not exactly widely known, but I think it, many of you probably already know that 70% of the cost for our services is behind the wheel, and that's the operator. We also pay close attention to uh, requirements according to the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. So we are very careful to review our service changes and make sure that there is no discriminatory action or disparate treatment of our customers. At the same time, we have to pay very close attention to the Americans with Disabilities Act and make sure that our service is accessible from the stop and, that on, and also on board our trains and buses. Um, when we're looking at the overall service design, we, are, we have to look at it as, a, again, a whole, and we have to make sure that the whatever we're proposing we have measured the effect on the overall network and in some cases we do have to make you know mod modifications because of the effects on transit dependent markets uh, also when we are measuring a, a service change or looking at a modification we take into account the availability of alternative services for customers who are negatively impacted and also at times we are asked to respond to demographic changes changes where services currently not offered. So if I go to the next slide. So this is a picture of going back in time to the good old days, which sounds a lot like last year uh, or 2019, uh, not 2020. We, we want to remember 2020, but don't want to relive it. Uh, in looking at the service uh, performance of our system as a whole, you'll no notice that there are a number of different uh, symbols for our CBE local, urban local, suburban local, all those different types of services scattered across this graph. This graph is an attempt to show the efficiency of those of, of the services and also measure the level of boardings on those services. So as you may know, we one of our top performers looking at the graph going up uh, and to the to the right. Uh, our top performer in 2019 was actually a regional service, and that was the Route 122X. Uh, and then if you look uh, to the next dot over was a CBD local, uh, followed again by another regional, followed again by an urban local. Now, I mentioned this <clears throat> to explain that not only does the geographic network overlap, but the performance of those services actually overlap. So going on to the next slide. So 
to give you an idea of the actual measures uh, that we use to look at our services, we offer the, uh, the this table, which is also available on our website. Uh, this defines the 10% max and 10% and 25% max for the subsidy level per boarding for each uh, type of service, and also the boardings per hour minimums for each type of service. So the way we look at it at this point is if something falls in that 10% max or the 10% minimum, it's something we must look at. Or if something falls in both categories, both the subsidy and the passenger per hour, that is something we must look at as well. So with that, I want to turn it back to Doug, who want, who's going to kind of describe more to the point of, you know, what the subject was about, and that is trying to provide you with some sense of an idea of uh, our core network system. So I turn it to you, Doug. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so understanding that this committee was interested in, in understanding um, what, uh, what a core network might look like or, or how, um, how RTD services operate across you know, the large regional district, um, Jesse and I have looked at, uh, at what routes operate in a you know uh, fashion that serves multiple counties as well as those routes that operate um, in serving primarily one county. Um, this first list here is those routes that serve multiple counties. This makes up the bulk of our um, of our service here. Um, but if you go to the next slide, these are the services that that either operate in a single county or primarily serve a single county. Um, and they generally fall into three categories. Um, local routes that happen to be in one county but continue to serve regional connections. So, um, these routes uh, tend to be uh, the routes uh, up in Boulder County, um, connecting to and from the city of Boulder, Lafayette, Louisville area up there, um, and then uh, out in, um, and then there's a few of them in Jefferson County as well that they still serve the regional connections, but um, but really only operate in in one county there. Um, the next uh, next category is regional routes that uh, primarily serve one county. Um, these these are routes that go to uh, places like the Parker to Denver Route P really only serves Denver County bringing those or uh, Douglas County I'm sorry bringing those passengers into Denver um, our Skyride routes taking passengers uh, from outlying counties directly to the airport who might not have uh, service uh, on our uh, a line there um, and then uh, the final category that, that most of these fall into is routes that were formerly part of longer routes um, that, that did go through multiple uh, jurisdictions uh, that have been kind of converted to feeder routes as our rail system has expanded. Um, so there's a cluster of these down in southeast Aurora connecting with Nine Mile Station, uh, formerly uh, longer routes that used to go downtown before 2006. Um, as well as uh, some routes in the, the Green Valley Ranch area, um, Northeast Denver area as well. Um, other than that, uh, the, there, there are very few routes on this list that uh, really serve you know, a, a, local, uh, a local service um, that, that you know, really isn't impacted by the overall regional or overall regional system in that case. Um, one thing that that is not shown on on this list is uh, the flex rides, and those do tend to fall into the the single county category and um, and focus more on a, a, on a local service uh, connecting with the overall regional system, but on a on a much smaller scale than uh, than any of these routes here. So um, with that, uh, we can go to the next slide, and I think Jesse and I are ready to take questions. That's great. Thanks, Doug. Julie, you're muted. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so what I was just saying to myself was that anybody who has questions, um, feel free to jump right in there um, and ask. And if not, you can always put your question in the chat as well if you have any questions for, for Jesse or Doug. Julie, 
So happy new year, everybody. It's Jackie and I apologize. I'm going to ask a very parochial question. Why is there no South team? There's an East and a West and a North, but no South. And even if it's just semantics, why can't you call it a North South team? Uh, that's a great question. And I'm going to say it's because we're above the Mason Dixon line. Uh, we, we don't <laughs> have one of those. <laughs> Actually, I, we inherited the geographic, or I definitely, I've only been with RTE for about 29 years. And uh, oh, we segmented in, in that way. So it's not my fault. Okay. No, it's nobody's fault, and I'm not. And I'm not. I, I, I was a little tongue in cheek, but quite frankly, I, I, I do think maybe it's something that should be considered. I just, I do think that it. Uh, it just love sound of right. Pete. I know. I'm just going to say it. I, I apologize for the parochialness. All right, but I do have another real question. Um, it, Jesse, you indicated, and first of all, thank you to you and Doug for the great presentation. But you indicated at the beginning that, um, that. Uh, that Reimagine RTD was looking at developing the core, uh, identifying a core, the core system, and then that was kind of put on hold. I guess what other additional, because there was a lot of groundwork done. I know the re final report didn't come out yet, but what else do does RTD need to identify the core system? I guess would, would be my real question, in addition to wanting a South team. Well, actually, in looking at the type of information that the reimagined group was was looking at, pulling, trying to find origin and destination information from not just our current users but potential other users, you know, they were on the right track in defining uh, what uh, a core system could be. Uh, but I, I, one of the things that I do want to make sure uh, that that's clear is that our our current the way that we look at the system, it's hard for me to say what is core versus what, because I always make the association with core being important. And each and every one of those areas and each and every one of those routes are important to us. And they're important because they provide a connection. So I don't want it lost in um, any type of translation that in identifying a core uh, kind of creates a, a, a a hierarchy of our root structure. I think I think each one of our roots, and I, if I didn't get it across, each one of the categories of roots are very important. Um, our suburban locals, though the ridership may not be very high on those roots, they do function as a connection to the overall goal of mobility. Um, that that is true of our flex rides and and all of our services. So I'm, I'm hoping that answers the question. And I'll so, I'll add on it, some oh, to that as well. Um, from the from the reimagined side, looking at, at what may be defined as a core network was was somewhat of an internal exercise as we were developing alternatives for reimagine RTD uh, in 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 looking at services that are out there today that um, that essentially need no modification um, in, in the way that they operate. They're they're the ones that are out there. Um, doing they're they're carrying high loads of passengers today making those regional connections and um we we didn't get far enough to to you know actually nail down a definition but it, it includes a, a great deal of our system already and as jesse said uh, when you know we, we we need to include the whole system in it um nothing is is really less important or more important than other uh, than other than other services that we offer in trying to to have a cohesive network to operate. Um, but as as reimagine uh, picks up again this year, um, looking at at what may be considered a core network uh, may be part of that again later this year. So um, this is Deborah Johnson. If I can chime in, I'm the general manager and CEO. Just to frame this a little more, as we look at this holistically and we're trying to discern where it is that we need to go, and having met with the team yesterday or yesterday, excuse me, last week to provide some direction as when we take off with Reimagine RTD, I think it's incumbent upon us to look holistically, as Doug pointed out, 
to it as being a transportation network because there are some interdependencies and quite naturally there's some areas of the transportation network that would be qualified as more heavily used routes but we'd be remiss not to talk about how those other types of route and lines feed into the system to get people where they need to go when they need to get there. So leveraging that going forward and identifying some core guiding principles that will help us make informed decisions about how we look at the system holistically and how we apportionment a portion rather certain elements to service delivery, I think that's part and parcel what we plan to do as we re-engage and uh, meet with stakeholders and community members to ascertain where it is we're trying to go and how we optimize and basically make some elements of the system more efficient. So what might that mean? That might mean that there's not a one seat ride. That might mean that there's transfers, but we're utilizing different forms of uh, transfers as opposed to using a 40 foot bus. Perhaps there's, you know, a flex ride or, you know, some other ride sharing entity that feeds into what we would call the spine of the system to move people. So I just wanted to impart that upon all of you all because we don't want to be mired down into what we know it is to be today, but we're trying to reimagine what it could be tomorrow and all of these things come into play once we have an understanding of those guiding principles that we can leverage going forward thank you thank you deborah awesome. thank you so much another question from the group okay Julia. i'm going to ask another one no good right you no, go ahead, Jackie. I always love your questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. No, but uh, I am just curious, and this is more to Doug, that we had been talking, and I and you know there are so many groups. I I apologize, but it wasn't, but I, it was the travel shed work. Have we seen the travel shed work that that kind of that Doug, and and maybe it wasn't this group I was talking about that, but um, about how people are commuting and where they are commuting, and it, and I thought it was Dr. Cog that was doing some of that work um that i'm not sure of i know that we are scheduled to talk to dr cog about that topic sorry, Doug. Wrong Doug. Doug Rex. i oh, apologize Doug. Oh, yeah I was, I was wondering too jackie no i but apologize you're happy to answer uh, doug Moreau. um no we yes yeah, so as part of the the reimagine rtd initiative um yeah we were using some of our data for sure now we are scheduled as doug Moreau, monroe suggested doug and i think it's next week isn't it the 11th maybe or something like that we're planning it together to have a conversation about about travel shed and what that might look like with regards to um possible you know uh, local service councils those types of things um i will say that just based on the information that we got today and again i would also like to thank jesse and doug for their presentation it was it was uh, quite useful um you know just seeing the number of multi-jurisdictional multi-county routes it seems to suggest you know less versus more local service councils. Um, and it's given me a whole different perspective on what that might look like, quite frankly. I'm really curious and interested in the travel shed information now. Um, so that conversation next week, I think will be great. And, and as I suggested at the last meeting, uh, Mayor Malay, you know, we are planning on convening that technical work group to help us and, you know, kind of weeding through some of this information. So kind of stay tuned on that. Thank you. Rhett, go ahead, bud. Um, Jesse, I had a couple questions, uh, particularly on that 50% of customers uh, who transfer at least once. Is that, is that, I really have three questions. First one is, is that the same for rail and bus? Or are there far fewer on rail changes? The question that was asked um, to, via a, a, a customer survey. So overall, it did survey both rail and bus customers. Is now, there data gathered on when a person enters a, a, a bus or a car and when they exit? So uh, would there be some hard data as opposed to the sort of thing you can typically get from surveys, which may be less uh, less reliable sometimes? A perfect system, there would be. So if we had the ability to, with our APCs or our automatic passengers counters to to count both the boarding and the alighting of our customers, then we would be able to track that sort of data or if there was some form of identification of a, a customer flowing through the system. But as you can imagine, a lot of people uh, would might not uh, smile on the idea of being tracked in, in a certain way, but it's certainly the information that we would like to like to have. So the right. way that we do it currently is again with those customer surveys, but it's um, it's information that I do think 
is being would be borne out or more so borne out in the reimagine effort because they were using data and, and looking at where people wanted to go and we could question or query that information against uh, how our routes are currently laid out uh, versus the way that they should be laid out and what what about average uh, commute time for rtd customers do you know what that is and also do you know what the average transfer wait time is Overall, you know, you have to look at that information. It would be more useful to look at it um, on a route level basis. So if you could give me an idea of certain types of routes that you would like to look at, we can certainly give you that information. That'd be great. I, I'm involved in this. Uh, my passion here is how do we get people out of cars and into RTD? And, right. and so that's the sort of thing that's always a challenge when you look at commute times versus driving versus jumping in your car. And we don't want to just have the transit dependent people uh, using RTD. We want to try to reach out to a larger market. Okay, so in, in terms of the differences between rail and bus, was there anything from the surveys that stood out on the transfers? Um, actually, I think what would be advantageous is for me to send you the survey data. Uh, That'd be terrific. Yeah. And there's a lot of information in there uh, that talks about how not only how uh, people are using the system, but uh, what they think about it. And some of that information as far as what you're, what you're speaking to, and that is travel time, you know, some of that is borne out in there as well. Terrific. Great. If you if you send it to Ron or, or Doug, they'll get it to me. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. Enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Yes. Great. Jaya, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, Jesse, I was just curious, uh, Jesse or Doug Monroe, um, thank you for the presentation. I was just curious to know if you might be able to get any sort of the um, data that Rut was requesting just via the, the TAP data when folks board the system. Does that, what kind of insight does that give you all? As far as when people get onto uh, boarding the, the the system, as far as the you're, you're asking about the fare information, uh, right. that the, I mean, when folks tap to get onto the transit system, I mean, I'm assuming that that gives you a certain level of information on um, maybe not necessarily the transfers, but you know how folks are riding and in that length of time, maybe between their first tap to the second tap or whatever that might look like. I, I'm just curious if you all have used that in any form. I'm going to say that I haven't. I'm not going to speak for Doug because he's in a in a different department. But I have not made use of that information by itself because you know I'm normally I'm being very zippy pinheaded about the total number of boardings on a given route and where those boardings are. Um, not as concerned as to who is actually using this the the system um, using more raw data. But Doug, have you had a chance to use any of the tap information? I have not. Um, I'm not sure how much of it we're able to use for that kind of thing. I know there's there's a lot of concerns with it based on the, the types of passengers that have them. And most passengers uh, using our, our smart card system have eco passes who tend to focus on um, park and ride type service and, and don't do a lot of transfers. And I know for, you know, using um, uh, uh, the the wallet the cash portion of those uh, smart cards the the adoption rate is not particularly high um, and I, I don't know if uh, if we have that information available or not right if I can add in this is Deborah Johnson and having gone through this at a other system um, basically it's very hard in reference to that because people aren't tapping on and tapping off to the point that Jesse made about alighting so the data would be skewed there are different um, technological advancements that would enable us to do this if you are using mobile, you know, ticketing and things of the like and utilizing, you know, one cell phone to garner where the GPS is. And then more so when you're using various uh, tap data as well, some of its privacy issues. So holistically, we don't have a system in place at RTD that will enable us to make an informed decision relative to the ridership. So right now, all we have is a snapshot in time uh, through the customer satisfaction surveys that we could utilize to basically assume what the ridership is doing holistically. All right, thank you. So one question that I do have is actually, um, I, I, I definitely uh, appreciate your perspective in your presentation to help 
give me a, a better background on how you guys are doing service design and evaluation and things like that. One question is how are you getting um, outside input when it comes to any type of service changes or evaluation? What is your process for, for getting outside input from the community or from local electeds or from really anybody outside of RTD? How does that work, that whole process? Sorry, I'm trying to get my phone to cooperate with me. Uh, that's an excellent question. And, you know, the communication that we get from our customers uh, comes in via email, uh, via the telephone, uh, either direct or via our customer uh, care center. Uh, we also hear from municipalities and we do have some set um, meetings with different organizations, TMAs, TMOs. Uh, we hear from our internal customers, which are, of course, our uh, transit operators, rail operators, bus operators, on a constant basis and have set, um, set responsi responsibilities and contracted requirements to meet with them to get input on the, on the system as well. So um, we're receiving information all the time on, on a regular basis about um, the, the quality of our service. In other words, uh, whether it's on time, whether it, and then whether it goes to where they want to go, we receive requests coming directly from local governments um, and also from other special interest groups. So uh, it, it's it's constant. Could it be improved or increased? I'm certain it can be increased, and you know, uh, and with all things, it certainly can be improved. Okay, um, is there typically um, a period of time that you kind of uh, you know, open up the forum of like, hey, just so everyone in this community knows, we're thinking about making this change. You know, we have a comment period. Do, do, does that exist um, yes. in your process? Yes, uh, that's uh, awesome. That's a great question. Um, we make service changes three times a year, primarily in January, May, and it's contractually required in September, but we often do it in August to allow for uh, schools to go in session. Uh, so during those time periods, we're, we're about to go into one for May, where we're going to go out to the public with proposals that say, you know, that we're, we're looking at, even though we're un still under COVID, we're looking at the following things for, for changes. Uh, and then we, um, you can actually email in via service.change uh, your comments on the on the service change. Uh, we again receive phone calls via uh, customer care, and we also hear from the local governments during that that time period. Normally, before COVID, uh, if we were to make a major change, like let's say we were having to cut back uh, services in a given area, it would be normal for us to hold public hearings in that area to allow for the public to come in and comment. Um, under COVID, we're not able to do that. So uh, this last change that we did for September, we did utilize uh, Microsoft Teams and also Facebook Live. Uh, and I was kind of felt some kind of way about using Facebook Live, but uh, it actually turned out to be have a utility beyond what I had expected. That is, it had the highest participation and at the same time, people could review the information over time and actually provide additional comments. So I think we'll be going that route again, but yes, we, we do have that process and we do receive a lot of customer input. Uh, but again, like I said before, it, it certainly can be improved. Okay, awesome, great. Jackie, you have another question? Uh, yes, I just was curious if consideration is given to providing service to anchor institutions. Um, and I, I put it in the chat, you know, our, our uh, schools, healthcare facilities, social services uh, agencies, uh, the court systems. I know um, the places people need to get to. Great question. And yeah, they are a primary contributor to our ridership. Everything from how well the skip route does in C, uh, near CU Boulder uh, to our Denver Public School dedicated transit services, which kind of drive, again, our need to cancel services in May and turn on school tripper services in, in August. Uh, we also have created an individual routes. The reason why the Route 66 actually exists along Arapaho is because of Arapaho County Municipal Center 
uh, actually moving out uh, to, to that area. Uh, the same can be said of the Route 120 in the Brighton area. Uh, so yes, we, we do look at those as major ridership generators and a large, you know, uh, by definition uh, and by purpose of those entities, a lot of the customers of those entities are transit dependent. And, and I think community colleges is one that I guess I was curious about in particular. I, I know uh, getting access to community college in the Douglas County area is very challenging for folks. And they've come to the city of Lone Tree asking us to help with it. And also getting folks to Sky Ridge Hospital has also been a challenge, which is why I, I guess I'm, I'm at. And, and uh, do you guys specifically go out and reach out to the anchor institutions or do you wait for them to come to you? Uh. No, we reach out to those and they reach out to us. Uh, Sky Ridge Medical Center, to, to give you an example, uh, when they opened, Maureen Tarrant was the, uh, she was the um, uh, CEO of the, of, of the Jesse, hospital. You're dating yourself. Yes, I am. <laughs> but it's true. But I, I enjoyed working with Maureen in developing, you know, alternative services. They found that they could use some of their security guards and other staff to connect to uh, the uh, Ridgegate Station. And so they they did some of that, but at the same time, they gave us a, a spot to lay over a couple of our 400 series routes in that area as well. And that was done through coordination. So the answer is yes, uh, we, we do that. The, uh, the most recent community college uh, type of service, we have a new route 157. That was an advent of the uh, University of Colorado A-Line service, uh, was directed at providing service to the community college in Aurora. Um, and uh, the ridership on it is primarily uh, the the students there, but at the same time uh, the the connecting community. But on a, on regular occasions, we are contacted by schools, hospitals, um, and even today, uh, it, even under COVID, we do have a lot of communication coming from, of course, the, the hospitals uh, asking for you know changes to service. Julie, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Jesse and Doug, thanks so much for the presentation. Really appreciated that. I think um, some communities' experiences have, you know, in the past has been that uh, RTD decides ahead of time what they think should happen in terms of service cuts and then shows up in the community and does public hearings. And it's sort of on the you know the community has to turn out people to sort of claw back the recommendations and um and just curious as as we we think about sort of better ways to do this um whether or not there's been some thought around maybe sitting down proactively with communities saying hey we've got some numbers here that are worrying us or we're experiencing cost constraints can we jointly problem solve what would work best um, and and sit down with the stakeholders ahead of time to draft a proposal before um, going out for public hearing. And I'm just curious your thoughts on on service improvements because there is that sense out at least in some communities that there's not um, enough local participation in the decision making process. Okay. Yeah. I that that's a, a fair assessment, and I've heard that actually come from. Uh, customers and, and come from the community. Uh, it is un unfortunate because in a couple of instances, I was uh, in the process of trying to explain what we were looking at for something that was going to happen that would not be implemented for a three month period. Uh, but the and the the public process was again gathering that that input. Those this, the decision that I that we had to make or that the district had to consider was something that was uh, immediate and that it was a budgetary shortfall that required us to make uh, a, a change and make a, an, an immediate change. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, to let the, the public know uh, in the amount of time that the public would feel comfortable with that decision because quite frankly, there is no comfort when it's your service that's being impacted. Uh, there is no agreement or agreeance in, you know, saying that you know that service needs to to go away. So it it, it will it will be 
I'd love to say that, yeah, we, we can have a conversation well in advance a year ahead and, uh, you know, warn people about certain routes, but it's very difficult to do that because I don't know about you, but I did not see COVID coming. And it's here. I, I, I did not either. And I, I certainly appreciate that. And I guess this committee both has to sort of figure out how to make recommendations on how to help RTD get over the COVID hump, but also solve problems that existed pre-COVID. And my question was really more to pre-COVID. I totally get that uh, the global pandemic has sort of turned things on its head. I was more the idea of, and I think that's where the impetus for local service councils comes from, is um, uh, the notion of sort of co-creating and partnering with local com communities in a proactive manner um, to really look at different solutions that might work to expand or maintain transit service rather than having it come seemingly from RTD on high as, as here's the answer that we think is, is the right one for your community as opposed to sitting down with people ahead of time and figuring out yeah, what that a, might look like. Yeah, perhaps the strategy would be to have a, uh, a conversation about overall performance. Some of the information that was presented today uh, spoke to the an annual review of how our services are performing, and of course, in that in that information, we of course can discuss routes that are on the bubble, routes that are not performing well. We can identify those and let the community know ahead of time that hey, this is this is definitely something that you know please look look out for because if we do get into a situation where uh, finances require us to make uh, cuts. Those are certainly the roots that would bear the brunt of it. Sure, thanks. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. And I think that, um, you know, Elise's point is really important in a lot of ways because uh, it really is about that proactive conversation and, um, and just also just being real about what the situation is. So Jesse, you were talking just a second ago about, um, you know, the annual evaluation and, you know, these numbers aren't looking good. And, you know, how do you, how can we, you know, change the process to where we as, as local community members can come together to have that conversation um, and, and actually just kind of be a part of it. I think that's probably what um, the biggest ask could be. Um, and then, you know, how can local governments really play a part when it comes to, um, you know, helping make some of these under, uh, decisions and really understand, you know, transfers and destinations and things like that. And so, like, I, I really think it's that proactive conversation that um, that piece uh, is really the heart of a lot of concern um, that we're hearing. Um, not only from this committee members, but, you know, our colleagues across the region. Any other questions or comments that we want to share with Jesse or Doug? Yeah, Julie, this is Dea. I just have um, one additional question uh, that I wanted to just see if we might be able to get answered. And if not, we can always uh, connect offline. But I am just kind of curious to the question around proactive engagement and, um, you know, it, at least in my time with Mile High Connects, it seems like some of the routes that are up for um, re service reduction are, are often the same routes that come up time and time again. And so I'm just wondering, um, how often do you see the same routes uh, come up for, um, for reduction in service? And, and what, is that what does that look like over the over your course, Jesse and Doug, um, over your time with with RTD, do you do you see that trend? Because at least that's what I'm hearing from community advocates. So I'm just kind of curious if if you can ground truth that for me. Well, great question. I'm not sure um, I can answer it without you know some empirical data right in front of me. Uh, my memory is not that good. I'm I'm, I'm getting up there. <laughs> so. Uh, but I will say that if an area or a route is not performing well and misses the, uh, the service standard for its type of service and a decision is made to not exactly eliminate the route as a whole, 
but instead uh, make changes to it in part. In other words, reduce service instead of eliminate service. The likelihood that that service is going to improve based on that uh, that reduction is it's you know it's not solid. It, it may actually improve and push it up the uh, up the line in terms of overall efficiency or passengers per hour, uh, or it, it might not improve it uh, based on the cut. So it's not one given area in particular that um, has uh, very low performing routes there. It could be the, the route. So, uh, but I have seen the exact opposite of that, uh, one being the route four, uh, which in 2012, we actually uh, eliminated the route. But in 2014, we reinstated it because looking at the trends on the route four which goes uh, down morrison uh it was actually didn't meet the productivity standard but it was on its way uh now i can happily say that you know as of you know a, a year ago we added uh saturday service onto that 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 new route and it's doing well and and, and doing uh very good uh are there routes that historically have had poor performance that are still out there Yes, uh, there are there are a, a few routes that do not um, have great ridership, and the way of actually increasing or Im improving uh, that service we we have not found yet. It may be that we need to take a harder look at whether or not the service type actually fits for that for that group. So when I when I think about that, I think about the service the prior Route 160 in Brighton which uh, was a fixed route system uh, or fixed route service that did not perform well at all. We replaced it with the Brighton Call and Ride and actually uh, the Brighton Call and Ride actually did much better than the fixed route 160. So that's one example of changing the, the service type uh, as, a, as a response rather than eliminating the route altogether. But there, does, there do come times, and I, I hate to say it, but if something, if something doesn't carry uh, a level of ridership that justifies it as a mass transit service, a hard call has to be made, and that is the elimination of that service. I hate to do it because, you know, again, it's like killing your own ideas. It's it's not something we we enjoy doing, but it's something that we have to do in accordance to the the policies of the the regional transportation district. Um, so, Jesse, I do have one quick question, and this is, again, another background question for me. Um, how are service standards defined or established? Um, do you guys revise those over a period of time? Is it like an industry standard? How, no. do, those, how do those come to be? Yes, uh, we revise them from time to time, and we actually recalculate them each year, every year. So, um, like I said, the 2019 data that I was showing you uh, in the presentation, uh, we are undergoing the same process for 2020. For so the numbers change uh, along with you know uh, that that update. So the requirement for uh, the minimal number of boardings per hour and the subsidy levels they they do change with each uh, with each year. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Dale, was that a new question you put in the chat? Sorry, don't remember. We also have Lynn. Go ahead, Lynn. Thanks. Um, this just conversation just brought to mind a um, situation that Alex Hyde-Wright, who's on the phone, would remember details better. But um, I think probably at the end of 2019, it was pre-COVID, there was uh, a route that was scheduled to be cut way back that involved uh, Boulder County, Lafayette, uh, Longmont, heading into Denver, and uh, a group of the of Boulder County and and all of those cities uh, got together. I think Boulder too, and um, were able to work with Natalie Handlos from Jesse's team and uh, and a couple of others, and and shift it so that one of the other routes there was some overlap was cut back, and that route w kept its service. And I think it worked out very well for everyone. And I wish I could remember the details better so Jesse would um, recognize it. But uh, you know, I thought that was a, a good way for the local governments to uh, to get involved. I don't know if that piece, if there's some way to get them involved earlier or anything like that that uh, 
that might be helpful. Thank you, Guy Singer. Uh, I would also uh, use as an example our, our current effort with the Route Y uh, in that it's not currently uh, in service because of the COVID service plan. However, we're working with uh, Boulder County to, to, to look at uh, supporting the taxi voucher program, and we're continuing that work um, through next week. Great, thanks. Great, thank you. And then Daya's question was uh, post route closure analysis. Um, is that something that RTD does to figure out why a route wasn't successful? And examining uh, the route network, uh, even when we do, and again, bringing up the route, route four, for example, uh, yeah, we, we, it's always in the heart and mind of the service planner that, you know, had the, the, or created the route or was attached to the route as a responsibility um, to question whether or not things have changed uh, in such a way that would actually support that route. Uh, that had been canceled before. We have revisited uh, to include the most recent one with the uh, uh, the G line uh, commuter rail service plan. Uh, we've revisited routes that we've canceled in the past, like the Route 125. Uh, the new Route 125 um, takes over a portion of uh, other routes and also its former self, and we put them back in play. And that we were able to do that by being able to look back at what the service was before looking at what it might mean uh, as far as connections to a new uh, transit uh, to, to a new facility like what was provided in um, the implementation of the g-line service all right well, thank you any final questions for jesse or doug or deborah johnson we also have on the line remember any final questions for this group before we move on to our next agenda item. I'm not seeing any, but thank you so much uh, for being here today and your presentation and willing to answer all of our questions that we had. Um, you guys did a fantastic job um, and we really appreciate your wisdom um, in, in, in giving us some more insight on this. Um, if that is it, <laughs> thanks, Jess. If that is it for this group, um, I am going to move us on quickly to our final agenda item in the three minutes that we have. Doug Rex, would you like to give us an update on the RTD Accountability Committee preliminary report? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I was hoping, like I'll get out, that I was going to be able to get the uh, get the full RTD Accountability Committee agenda out, which would include the report by the time this meeting rolled around, but I didn't get there. Um, our creative team, I just got the latest version from our from our communications folks. It looks great, um, but I wanted to give it one last go through before I sent it out to the full group. So you'll before my head hits the pillow this evening, you'll be getting the, the full RTD accountability committee agenda, which will include the report. It's about, oh, with appendices and all, it's probably 30, 30 or so pages. It's, it's about 20 pages without the appendices. Let me put it that way. So I think it's, you know, it's it's not too long that, uh, you know, will discourage somebody from reading it, but it really breaks it out. There's an introductory section, of course, kind of explaining the role and purpose of the of um, the RTD Accountability Committee, then then really gets into um, kind of the uh, uh, the activities of each of the subcommittees and with uh, a, a table that kind of summarizes um, what the focus area is, the work that have, has been initiated related to that focus area, and then kind of next steps or, or future investigations. So you'll be seeing that here shortly. I hate to just dangle it out there like this, but um, but it's real close. And we have been working with the RTD accountability co-chairs as well as the uh, subcommittee chairs. And so it's gone through several iterations and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty darn close. So you'll be getting it this evening. Great. So, Doug, this is Barbara McManus. How are you? Happy New yes. Year. Hi, Barbara. Happy New Year. So you're going to be getting it to this group uh, in short order, and then what is the process? Uh, what's the process after that? So I will be getting it to. So we'll be posting this. the The report will be part of our uh, our January 11th RTD Accountability Committee agenda. Um, so that will be posted this evening. And from there, the, um, the committee will consider 
that uh, sending that report on to yourselves, RTD, the governor's office, and the and the legislator le legislature. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. Oh, I should also All mention, right. Barbara, seeing you're on the phone. Um, I know we are scheduling a time for for our co-chairs to make a presentation to RTD, and I believe that's hap going to happen in January. I'm I'm looking. I don't know if anybody knows that for fact, but I know we're working on that. Do we know what date we're looking at? At least I don't. Um, is I don't know if Matthew's on the line. Matthew, do you know? I, I assume it would be at a an existing RTD yeah. board meeting. Matthew, is it January we're looking at? These microphones green, but I don't hear words. But we'll we'll uh, we'll find out. Okay, so they so um, there's only one committee meeting in January, and it's the twelfth. And all materials for that meeting um, would be due by Wednesday close of business. So um, we would if if you want if you wanted to move it forward. Uh, I could talk to the chair. We might be able to do an update in the board meeting on the 26th or in the first meeting in February. Uh, and Matthew has those dates. He and I discussed that a few weeks ago. Okay, Matthew just put uh, a comment in the chat that January 12th is the date we're looking at. So Elise, we'll get with you and Crystal and see if that's possible. Yeah, do we know what, well, yes. Somebody tell us the time so we can see if we can do it. Okay, so I know that we are at time, um, but I do want to give the opportunity, Deborah Johnson, if you are able to stay with us a little longer to do a brief update for CARES funding, is that something that you're able to do? Sure. Okay. Yes. Um, if this group is okay, um, uh, you feel free to stay on and let's uh, get Deborah's update. If you need to leave, um, I definitely understand. Okay, Madam Chair, are you ready or you want me to hold on for a quick second? I'm, I'm ready. Go ahead and go. Okay, thank so thank you very much for the opportunity. I know this is a burning topic for many people, considering that the president effectuated this um, bill into law uh, December 27th, but for everybody's edification, I know that most members of this group are probably familiar with the text and what it says uh, pertaining to how these funds should be used. With that as a backdrop, however, um, as it stipulates in the legislation, the Federal Transit Administration has to provide to us the tables uh, that basically tell us our apportionment amounts. And I know a lot of people have done back of the napkin scenarios in reference to what it is that we may anticipate receiving. But as it states in the, in the legislation that the FTA has 30 days in which to do that, um, having had some brief discussions last week, uh, keeping in mind that we are going to have a new president come into play and considering that the FTA administrator is a political appointee, uh, the acting administrator is anticipating having this shored up prior to January 20th. The next step thereafter is for that to be certified by the Department of Labor. So with all those dates as a backdrop, I'm anticipating that we'd have a better understanding of what might our apportionment be the latter part of January, but keeping in mind that this has to be certified by the Department of Labor. With that as a backdrop, a couple other nuances attributable to the process. It's basically discerning from the FTA's vantage point whether or not they're going to try to do an amendment to the grant application that we utilized for CARES Act funding back in March, or will it have to be an entirely new grant application process? So that falls into play with the dates as well. And then more so, uh, what is the guidance that FTA will provide to us as it relates to being able to draw down that money while it states it's for transit operations or uh, administrative costs uh, revolving around keeping transit employees um, employed. That's something that we rally around, but at this juncture without having those numbers provided by the Federal Transit Administration, we're sort of at a quandary not knowing what that means as it relates to, uh, to specific numbers in reference to the workforce. 
And so as we march down this path, recognizing as soon as we receive the tables, we'd be in a better position recognizing that we would do drawdowns as we did previously because they would be reimbursable. We can make informed decisions about what that might mean. And that segues into our actual service delivery model as we talked about uh, what we would do for all intents and purposes at this juncture, making decisions without having data readily available would be to supplement those heavily traveled routes as we try to ensure that we're providing a safe environment whereby we can maintain social distancing, looking at other aspects of frontline employees. Perhaps we leverage them in different arenas regarding keeping things clean and sanitized, considering that there's only one transit union here at this organization that represents a myriad of the different job classifications. So I'm happy to address any questions that anyone may have at this time. Great, thank you for that quick update. Any questions for Deborah? All right, I'm not seeing any at this point. So thank you so much for holding on and giving us that update. It sounds like it's going to be a, a lot of activity very quickly <laughs> taking place. Yes, so thank you so much for, for keeping us updated on that. Uh, really appreciate that. All right, guys. Well, I think that is all that we have time for today. Um, if anybody has uh, any other questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to Doug. Um, I'm sure he could do his best to, to answer any other questions that you guys have. But that's all I have for today's meeting, and we will see you on January 18th for our next upcoming meeting. Thank you all, and have a good rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thanks.